The Major League Baseball Hall of Fame is one of the most exclusive clubs in all of sports. The difficulty in getting elected can be proven by the sheer number of players who have not been elected despite public opinion that they are surefire 100% Hall of Famers. And today we're going to be looking at a major Hall of Fame snub from each of the 30 Major League teams. Some teams have multiple snubs, but I picked at least one player from each team, sometimes not choosing the most obvious so that he could be represented by another team that had less options. So if the player you expect isn't picked, just wait because he might be picked for another team that he played for. Also, I will be including steroid users on this list, so be ready for that. The comment section might be interesting. Let's move on to the selections. And starting with the Arizona Diamondbacks, I'm taking Kurt Schilling. How has Kurt Schilling not been elected into the Hall of Fame despite an 11-2 postseason record with a 2.23 ERA along with over 3,100 career strikeouts? three seasons of at least 20 wins, six all-star selections, and a World Series and NLCS MVP. He finished in the top 10 for the Cy Young Award five times, finishing second four times. Obviously, this guy, he, what's the problem? He must be a heavy steroid user, right? Nope. He's a conservative and he's ruffled some feathers on Twitter with his personal opinions. Let's just be honest. If he did not make his political opinions public and just retired onto a farm somewhere and never signed up for a Twitter account, he'd have a plaque right now in Cooperstown. And in my opinion, that is completely wrong. He deserves to be in based on his career and no one, regardless of how extreme in either political direction, should be held out because of their political views or taste. If I'm wrong and that's not the reason why, well fine, I still think Kurt Schilling should get in. He's a snub either way, whatever the reason. And for the Diamondbacks, I got Kurt Schilling. Moving on to the Atlanta Braves, and I got to give an honorable mention to Dale Murphy, but I'm going to take Andrew Jones. And what's most shocking to me isn't just that he hasn't been elected, but he only got 19.4% of the vote in 2020. Are you kidding me? One of the most elite players defensively and offensively for more than 10 years with zero steroid connections can't get 20% of the vote. 10 gold gloves, just 66 bombs shy of 500 home runs, and he can't get 20% of the vote. In 2005, this guy crushed 51 home runs and drove in 128 runs and would have easily been the MVP if not for Albert Pujols in his prime. He's a five-time All-Star and is being held out because injuries derailed his career and he struggled for the last few years of his career but he nearly hit 500 home runs and won 10 gold gloves. That's all I need to know. If Sandy Koufax is a surefire Hall of Famer for five years of dominance, how is Andrew Jones not a Hall of Famer for 10 years of dominance with his bat and his glove? For the Braves, I'm taking Andrew Jones. Moving on to the Baltimore Orioles and let the steroid controversies begin with my Orioles pick, but I am gonna take Rafael Palmero. Now, there will be steroid guys, like I said, so if you're strictly against steroid users getting in the hall, well, then we know where you stand and it's not a problem. Obviously, you won't want Palmero to get in, but I believe, despite being the first superstar name to fail a steroid test, that he should be considered because he became just the fourth player in history to hit 500 home runs and accumulate 3,000 hits. He was also a slick fielder. He won three gold gloves. The big question with Palmero is would he have been a Hall of Famer without steroids? And when did he start using? He was teammates with Jose Canseco as early as 1992 in Texas, so it's not a good sign. He is a borderline case because of that, but based strictly on the numbers, he is an absolute Hall of Famer. And moving on to the Red Sox, speaking of absolute Hall of Famers, it's the Rocket, Roger Clemens. I'm sorry, Roger Clemens and Barry Bonds are the two steroid-connected players who, in my opinion, should absolutely be in because one can reasonably come to the conclusion that they would have been 100% Hall of Famers even if they never touched steroids. When Clemens started to decline in the mid-90s before he touched steroids, he was already a first ballot Hall of Famer with three Cy Young Awards, an MVP, three 20-win seasons. This was simply one of the best starting pitchers in the history of the game. 
and we can ignore his numbers after he went to Toronto, and he's still deserving of enshrinement in Cooperstown. So for the Boston Red Sox, I'm definitely taking Roger Clemens. Now for the Chicago Cubs, and I would have picked Ron Santo, but he finally got elected by the Veterans Committee in 2011, right after he died, so that he couldn't enjoy the moment. Very nice, good job there. But anyway, I'll take a controversial selection instead. Since Santo is in, thankfully, I am gonna take Sammy Sosa. Now I've gotten into some arguments over Sosa not being on my unofficial ballots that I release on my channel. The only reason he's not on them is because I only have 10 slots and usually Sosa is like my 11th or 13th pick. I would like to vote for Sosa, but since the Hall of Fame voters won't vote for anybody, I keep having to pack my ballot. However, the reason I don't put Sosa until 11 or 12 or 13 is because I'm just not so sure he would have, well, I'm definitely not sure he would have had as good a numbers, but would he have even had Hall of Fame numbers without the steroids? I'm not sure, but that being said, this is a guy who broke Roger Maris's 61 home run mark three times and hit an absolutely unconceivable 243 home runs in four years. He was a seven-time All-Star with over 600 home runs. And yes, there are some advanced stats like war that don't look so great, but he was one of the biggest names in the game during a time when baseball turned a blind eye to steroids. He and Mark McGuire helped bring baseball back to the USA after a huge ratings crash after the strike. Unfortunately, they were also part of bringing it back into the darkness with the steroid scandals. But you know what? All these years later, I feel that Sosa and McGuire were amongst the best in the league in a league where steroids were everywhere. He was one of the best, and he put up numbers never seen before and never seen since. So Sammy Sosa is my pick for the Chicago Cubs. Now moving to the south side with the White Sox, and I'm gonna take Shoeless Joe Jackson, who was banned from baseball for life for his role in fixing the 1919 World Series. Now there have been a lot of debates on his involvement, but statistically, if he was throwing the World Series, he wasn't doing the best job. He had a series leading 375 batting average, including the series only home run. He threw out five base runners and he handled all 30 chances in the outfield with not one error. Even in the games that the White Sox lost, he performed well statistically. And also from the account of others involved, he wasn't even in in all the meetings. They just wanted to use his name to help gain more rapport with the gamblers and all that aside, I believe that Joe Jackson should get in because he's already paid the price for the scandal. He was banned from baseball for life, never allowed to participate again in the game he loved for the rest of his life. And at the time he played, we have to remember there was no players union. Players weren't paid like they are now. And White Sox owner Charles Comiskey had a reputation for paying his players as little as possible, even charging them to have their uniforms laundered. At the end of the day, people make mistakes. Joe Jackson has passed away. MLB loves to hold their players accountable for life, for not being perfect, yet they kept the game segregated for 60 years. So let's not act like MLB is perfect either. Sometimes it's time to just forgive and give a guy a plaque. And I believe Joe Jackson deserves one for a Hall of Fame baseball career. Moving on to the Reds, I'm gonna go with Scott Rowland. Now, if you're wondering, hey, Where's another former Red who has more hits than anyone in MLB history? Not to worry, he will be included later on this list, but I had to find a place for everyone, so he'll be included with another team he played for. But Scott Rowland, I had to find a place for him as well, so I'm gonna put him for the Reds. This is a guy like Andrew Jones, one of the best defensive and offensive players at his position for a decade plus. He won eight Gold Glove Awards, and offensively he ranks in the top 15 among third basemen in home runs, RBI, and slugging. This is a seven-time All-Star, more than deserving of enshrinement. I believe he will get elected within the next couple of years, but we'll wait and see. For now, he is my Cincinnati Reds snub, and it's Scott Rowland. Moving on to the Cleveland Indians, I considered a bunch of names, including Manny Ramirez, who did hit 555 home runs. One problem with him is he failed not one, but two PED tests, and he kind of has a history of not being the greatest teammate, quitting on his teams, and just having an overall negative impact on the game. But I can't deny that his numbers are Hall of Fame worthy. And if there was no one else to pick, I would have picked Manny. But instead, I'm going with Kenny Lofton. Yes, Kenny Lofton, who somehow got booted from the ballot after just one year, despite 
a great career in which he had 2,428 hits, 622 steals, four gold gloves, six all-star selections, and he played right amid the steroid era and still had a fantastic career defensively, offensively, on the base paths. If you look at the Jaws ranking for center fielders, this is a metric measuring overall Hall of Fame worthiness. Lofton is 10th all time, and he is above Hall of Famers like Richie Ashburn, above Andre Dawson, above Kirby Puckett, above Hack Wilson. I think you get the point. He might not be an absolute shoe-in, but he was certainly snubbed of more opportunities after getting less than 5% of the vote in the first year. I'm taking Kenny Lofton for the Indians. And moving on to the Rockies, which was the easiest choice on the entire list. As soon as I read Rockies, I said, okay, it's Todd Helton. Todd Helton spent 17 years with this team, crushing 369 home runs and had a career, career 316 batting average. And he was elite with the bat and the glove, winning three gold gloves, and he could have easily won more. Four silver sluggers, represented the Rockies in the All-Star game for five consecutive seasons. But maybe most impressive, his career OPS, 18th best in baseball history. I believe he is an absolute Hall of Famer, and anyone keeping him out because he plays in Denver, there is a major league team in Denver. A player should not be criticized because of where their team plays home games. Besides, it is Denver. It's not the moon. It's not Mars. The ball carries well, but Helton was a machine at home and the road throughout his career. This dude was legit. In 2000, he hit 372 with 147 RBI. He should be in ASAP. Moving on, we got the Detroit Tigers, and I'm taking Lou Whitaker. Going back to that Jaws ranking, Whitaker finds himself above Hall of Famers Roberto Alomar, Craig Biggio, and Bill Mazeroski. Yet the five-time All-Star, three-time Gold Glover, four-time Silver Slugger received an absolute pathetic 2.9% of the vote, falling off the ballot immediately. Are you kidding me? Whitaker was not only a great defender, but he had a dynamic bat with power, hitting at least 19 home runs five times, finishing with 244 in his career, which is quite a lot for a second baseman. And he also helped the Tigers win a World Series. He also won the Rookie of the Year in 78. And if you look at baseball reference, Whitaker has a higher war than Reggie Jackson, Frank Thomas, and I'm talking modern day White Sox Frank Thomas, Derek Jeter, and a lot of other huge names. Yet he falls off the ballot after one year. That is an absolute snub. I'm taking Lou Whitaker for the Tigers. And now for the Houston Astros, I'm going to go with closer Billy Wagner. Now the Astros drafted him in the first round and he pitched for Houston for nine seasons. He ranks sixth all time with 422 saves, 1,196 career strikeouts as a reliever, which is fourth most in baseball history. This is a seven-time All-Star who had an astonishing 2.31 career ERA, and in his final big league season, he closed out 37 games for the Braves with a 1.43 ERA. As far as his regular season career, which is the, obviously the majority of a player's career, he is a no-doubt Hall of Famer. When you compare him to his peers, like Bruce Sutter and Trevor Hoffman, who have already gotten in, it's a no-brainer. The only downside for Wagner is a disappointing postseason career, which wasn't a huge sample. But in my opinion, a great postseason career is a bonus that could put someone in who otherwise might be a borderline case. But it shouldn't keep someone out who had a Hall of Fame career, which in my opinion, Billy Wagner had. So let's move on now to the Kansas City Royals. And for the Royals, I'm gonna go with another relief pitcher who was removed from the ballot after one year. And it's the great submariner, Dan Quisenberry. And all will, I will even admit here, this is a very borderline case, certainly not a shoe in but the fact that he was only on the ballot for a year is very upsetting. This is a dude who led the American League in saves five out of six seasons and finished among the top three in Cy Young voting for an unbelievable four straight years, which is insanely impressive for a relief pitcher. He finished his career with 244 saves, 2.76 ERA, helped the Royals to win a World Series in 1985 with a 2.08 ERA. And he won the Rolades Reliever of the Year Award five times. 
made three All-Star games. Like I said, it's not a 100% definite Hall of Famer, but to only get considered for one year and fall off the ballot just because he wasn't so great in the last few years of his career, I think he deserves more consideration. So I'm going to say for the Royals, I'm going to go with Dan Quisenberry as the snub. Moving on to the Los Angeles Angels, I'm going to go with Bobby Gritch, who was on the Hall of Fame ballot in 1992 and got a mere 2.6% of the vote, falling off the ballot. Are you kidding me? Throughout the 70s and 80s, Gritch was an excellent player, both offensively and defensively, making six All-Star teams, winning four gold gloves and a silver slugger. He didn't get any Hall of Fame support because his final career numbers aren't overly spectacular, just 224 home runs and a 266 average. But if you consider his position, he is among the best offensive second baseman of all time, ranks eighth all-time on the Jaws list, ahead of several Hall of Famers like Ryan Sandberg, Jackie Robinson, Roberto Alomar, and Craig Biggio. He also hit a clutch home run in Game 5 of that 86 ALCS that would have been an all-time great home run if Dave Henderson and the Red Sox hadn't made history with that amazing come-from-behind win. But ultimately, Bobby Gritch was undervalued in 1992 and his Hall of Fame case should get another look. Now to the Los Angeles Dodgers. And I'm going to go with Oral Hershiser, a staple in that Dodgers rotation throughout the 80s and early 90s. He ended up playing 18 seasons and setting an MLB record with an astonishing 59 consecutive scoreless innings. As far as the regular season, Hershiser dominated the early part of his career. He won a Cy Young Award in 1988. He made three consecutive All-Star teams and even won a gold glove. His numbers eventually fell off after some injuries and surgeries, and he didn't end up with the most impressive career totals. 204 and 150 record with a 3.48 ERA. But where I think he deserves more consideration is his postseason career. Hershiser has won an ALCS and an LCS MVP, and a World Series MVP in 1988 when he helped the Dodgers win it all by throwing two complete games while allowing just two runs in 18 innings. He dominated when he was with the Indians as well, and he pitched 5.1 innings of scoreless baseball in the 99 playoffs with the Mets out of the bullpen at the age of 40. Hershiser entered his career with a 2.59 postseason ERA, and for all of those accomplishments, as well as his dominance throughout the first six years of his career, I believe he was snubbed when he got only 4.4% of the vote in 2007, falling off the ballot. Oral Hershiser deserves more consideration. Mishtaka, Wawatosa, Hershiser. For the Miami Marlins, I'm going to go with a guy who played there from their inaugural season in 93 through 1998 and helped them win a World Series title in 97 by hitting 320 in 50 postseason at-bats with three home runs. I'm talking about Gary Sheffield, who does 100% have Hall of Fame numbers, but unfortunately, he's got those PD connections. He ended up with 509 bombs, nine All-Star appearances, five Silver Sluggers, and a batting title in 92. But the problem, of course, is those steroid connections as he did do some training with Barry Bonds around 2002 and he has some ties to Balco. There's even some admissions that he used some of that cream, clear, whatever. And he doesn't have the best defensive metrics. So he's certainly not a guaranteed shoe in Hall of Famer because of all that. But Sheffield was one of the most feared hitters in the game for well over a decade. And with over 500 home runs, he should definitely be gaining some traction with more forgiving and younger voters. I personally think he should be in. And for that reason, I'm going to take Gary Sheffield as my Miami Marlins snub. Moving on to the Brewers. And I'm going to go with a very good player. In fact, a great player who many have probably forgotten. Cecil Cooper. This guy was a sixth round draft pick by the Red Sox and didn't get much opportunities with them. And then he signed with Milwaukee in 77, hit 300 with 20 home runs, and he only got better from there, making five all-star teams, winning consecutive Gold Glove awards, leading the league in RBI twice, and picking up three Silver Slugger awards. He topped 200 hits three times and finished his career with a 298 batting average and 2,192 
hits. He also hit 286 with a homer in the 82 World Series. Now, for someone who was as excellent on both sides of the ball and had as many accomplishments as he did, you'd expect to get a few Hall of Fame votes, right? At least 5% surely. Oh no, it's bad. It's real bad. Cecil Cooper did not receive a single vote during his one year of eligibility. Not one. Moving now to the Minnesota Twins, and the first name that came right to mind for me is Jim Cott, who pitched 25 years in the big leagues and helped every team he played for, including the Twins, for whom he won 25 games in 1966. He finished his career with 283 wins and an amazing 16 gold gloves. The only pitcher with more is Greg Maddox. Cott struck out 2,461 batters and he won at least 20 games three times. He made three all-star teams and he helped the Cardinals win a World Series in 1982 at the age of 43. But in 2003, he only got 26.2% of the vote and fell off the ballot after 15 years. I believe longevity means a lot, and when you combine a 25-year career with 16 gold gloves, 2,400-plus strikeouts, and nearly 300 wins, you have a Hall of Famer. How Jim Cott did not get more support is beyond me, but he is my snub for the Twins. Now on to the New York Mets, and I'm going to go with Keith Hernandez. If you're surprised by this, just listen to these career accomplishments. 17-year career, Hernandez, 11 gold gloves making him undeniably an elite defensive first baseman in the league for over a decade. He also won two silver sluggers, was elected to five all-star teams, and he won a National League MVP in 1979 by hitting 344 with 48 doubles and 105 RBI. He helped both the Cardinals and the Mets win a World Series, and he helped his teams enough to have a higher war than Hall of Famers Yogi Berra, Mike Piazza, Vlad Guerrero, and Willie Stargell, among others. Look, defense matters. And if certain players like Ozzie Smith can get in pretty much on defense alone, how does someone who was elite defensively and offensively not get in? I talked about Andrew Jones. Keith Hernandez is another one. This dude was snubbed. Now moving on to the great New York Yankees, and I do want to give a one shout out to the great Roger Maris, who not only hit 61 home runs in 61 to break Babe Ruth's single season home run record and won an MVP that year, but he won an MVP in 60 as well. This is a two-time MVP, and he also won a World Series with the St. Louis Cardinals later. So this guy had a great career. He is definitely a legend, and I would love to see him get a plaque, but I have to be honest, his career numbers are not quite there, so I can understand but I am gonna instead go with Don freaking Mattingly how is Don Mattingly not in with nine gold gloves he also won an MVP he was a six-time all-star three-time silver slugger he won a batting title major league player of the year he was just absolutely phenomenal unfortunately he had some injuries back problems and it cut his career a little bit short so his overall numbers don't look too insane he did get 2,000 hits 2,153 he did hit 222 home runs but still while he was active he was one of the best in the game for a decade all those gold gloves silver sluggers all-stars and an mvp in 1985 when he had 145 rbi don mattingly had a great career and now he's winning manager of the year awards with the marlins i mean what else do you got to do this dude needs to be considered he will get a plaque eventually it has to happen but for my new york yankees snub i have to take Don Mattingly. Moving on to the Oakland A's. Look, if I'm going to have Sammy Sosa and Gary Sheffield on the list, there's a couple of Oakland A's I have to consider. I did consider Jason Giambi, who won an MVP with Oakland, finished his 20-year career with 440 bombs, but I think the more obvious pick, the one I got to go with, the Oakland A's snub is going to be Mark McGuire. Yes, he did steroids, maybe throughout his entire career, since he was teammates with Jose Canseco since the beginning. But Mark McGuire was on a course with stardom since he was drafted. In the first round out of USC, he hit 49 home runs his rookie year, breaking a rookie record. He went on to hit 583 bombs, famously broke Roger Maris's single season record in 98, helping basically to save baseball, like I said earlier, with Sosa and becoming one of the biggest sports stars in the world. 
He was simply one of baseball's biggest stars for 15 years, and he's got 12 all-star selections and even a gold glove. Many are going to disagree for obvious reasons, and I completely understand that, but I personally think that the Hall of Fame should be just about the greatest, the stars of the game, the greatest players, and Mark McGuire is one of them. He should have a plaque, in my opinion, and he is my Oakland A's snub. It's an interesting point. Moving on to the Phillies, and I'm taking a guy who probably would have been elected in 2020 if the pandemic had not canceled the Veterans Committee meeting last year. Instead, they didn't elect anybody, and now, sadly, Dick Allen has passed away. And when he gets elected, he won't be able to enjoy the moment. And, you know, it should not have ever gotten to that point. Dick Allen was a Hall of Famer because of his 15-year career. He won the Rookie of the Year. He won an MVP award in 72. He's got seven All-Star selections. And during his peak 11 years from 64 to 74, only one player in baseball had a higher OPS. And it was by one point, and it was Hank Aaron. Dick Allen topped all the leaderboards in nearly every offensive category. And if you have any doubt that Dick Allen is a Hall of Famer, let me just say this. He has the same career OPS plus as Willie Mays. The only issue is that he didn't play long enough to gain all these milestone numbers, like 500 home runs and 3,000 hits, because he had some injury issues. But he was more than great enough to get elected. And he probably will get elected this year since he just died. It is an absolute shame he won't be able to be at his own ceremony. But I hope it happens because Dick Allen is a Hall of Famer. And he is my snub for the Phillies. Next, we got the Pittsburgh Pirates. And I'm going with Dave Parker, who never received more than 24.5% of the vote during his 15 years on the ballot. Although... In his prime, this was one of the most dangerous sluggers in baseball, and he had a cannon for an arm in the outfield. Big numbers, big awards. He got an MVP, three gold gloves, All-Star Game MVP, two World Series rings, back-to-back -back batting titles. He did it all, and he was a key member of the We Are Family Pittsburgh Pirates championship teams, and in 79, he hit 333 in the NLCS, 345 in the World Series, and he finished his career with over 2,700 hits, almost 3,000, and an insane 143 outfield assists. But again, he didn't hit the big zeros at the end, so he doesn't get in. The same player, he could have been the same player with the same career, but if he hit 3,000 hits, but let's just say he won no MVPs, no gold gloves, no rings, yet if he got 3,000 hits, all of a sudden he's a first ballot Hall of Famer. But no, he can't get more than 24.5% of the vote. Absolute insanity. Ridiculous. Dave Parker is my snub for the Pirates. You're right. You're right. Moving on to the San Diego Padres, I'm going to go with Steve Garvey, who played for the All-Star team, a ridiculous, at least for someone not in the Hall of Fame, 10 times, 10-time All-Star. Not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, not seven. This is another player who was elite on both sides of the ball. He won four gold gloves. He finished his career with a 294 average, 272 home runs. And if you're saying, where's the MVP? Oh, he got one. Garvey won it in 74. He finished second in 78. So he almost won two MVPs. And in fact, he received MVP votes for eight straight seasons. On top of all that, he was an Iron Man. So if that's not enough, this dude broke the NL record with 1,207 consecutive games played. And if that's not enough, we got more records. He set an MLB record with 159 errorless games at first base. This was simply one of the best players in the game over a long period of time. But, oops, he didn't reach the magic 3,000 hits. Guess he doesn't get to get in. Steve Garvey needs a plaque, and he needs it now. I apologize. What's the matter with you? Sorry. What the f*** is the matter with you? And now to my favorite team, the San Francisco Giants. And really, there is only one obvious pick, although I do want to give a shout out to Will Clark, one of my favorites, and also a guy who a little later I will get to on this list, and that's Jeff Kent. They both had great careers. But I'm going to go with the obvious. It is Barry Bonds, one of the best players in the history of the game, 
Bonds was a shoe-in, first-time, no-brainer, Hall of Famer before he ever touched, as Bob Costas would say, anything stronger than a protein shake. We can ignore all of the video game numbers he put out after the turn of the century, and he's still a Hall of Famer. There's only one argument to keep him out, and that's the fact that, yes, he did do steroids. But if you want to keep out one of the greatest baseball players to ever live, it's just something I cannot get behind. It's fine if that's your opinion, but this is a dude, if you think about it, he had to watch Sosa and McGuire be hailed as great heroes who saved baseball while he knew that he was 10 times as good as either of them, and he knew they were shooting up with steroids and that nobody was doing a damn thing about it, and that baseball didn't care, fans didn't seem to care, so he gave in to temptation and said, you know what, I'm going to do this. I wish he never did, but he did, and at the end of the day, even I can understand it. I don't agree with it, but I understand it, and this is one of the greats of all time. He won three MVPs and he made eight all-star teams with eight gold gloves before he touched steroids. Bonds needs a plaque. Barry Bonds deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Give it to him. Give it to him now. Let's go. Not ashamed of it. I'm not proud of it. It is what it is. So with that out of the way, let's go to the Seattle Mariners. And I'm going to take Omar Vizquel, who spent his first big league seasons with the M's. And what I never understood is how Ozzie Smith was a first ballot, surefire Hall of Famer, but Omar Vizquel, who, if you look at statistically, was just as good, if not better defensively, and certainly better offensively, he can't even sniff the Hall of Fame. He showed incredible longevity with a 24-year career, 11 gold gloves, and 2,877 hits. Nearly 3,000 hits. There you go, just missed the magic number. The only shortstops with more hits are Derek Jeter, Honus Wagner, Cal Ripken Jr., and Robin Yount, all 100% Hall of Famers. You could say the problem is he only made three All-Star teams and he played for a whole bunch of different teams, which, yes, I understand that hurts your case a little bit. But if Ozzie Smith is a Hall of Famer, Omar is as well. Now on to the St. Louis Cardinals, and I'm sorry, I have to cheat. I got to pick two players because... I couldn't decide between these two. First, there's Jim Edmonds, who got bumped off the ballot after one year. This dude was a human highlight reel in center field, and he won eight gold gloves and just seven home runs shy of 400 in his career. I wonder if he would have hit seven more and ended up with 400 home runs. Would he have gotten in, or at least would he have stayed on the ballot? I wonder. For his first six seasons in St. Louis, he averaged 35 bombs a year, and he helped the Cardinals to win a World Series in 2006, and he hit 13 postseason home runs. I can't believe he fell off the ballot after one year. But then, I think maybe even a slightly stronger case is Ken Boyer, an elite offensive and defensive player who won five gold gloves, and he had 11 all-star selections. He won the MVP in 64 after hitting 295 with 24 bombs and an MLB best 119 RBIs while leading the Cardinals to the World Series. All of his numbers look right in line with all the other Hall of Famers at his position, but somehow he got completely overlooked. So I don't understand it. Both Jim Edmonds and Ken Boyer deserve much more consideration. And those are my guys for the Cardinals. But moving on to the Tampa Bay Rays and by far the most confusing and frustrating snub in the entire list goes here and that's Fred McGriff. Now I could have easily picked him for the Braves or the Blue Jays but the Rays need a representative so I'm going to give them Fred who played for the Rays from their inaugural season in 98 until 2001. This dude is a 100% Hall of Famer who played the game clean right amidst the steroid era and instead of rewarding him for playing the game clean he got punished, stupidly enough, while also punishing those who chose to do steroids. Makes no sense. This man hit 493 home runs in his career, and I'm convinced if he had a mere seven more, he would already be in the Hall of Fame. Fred McGriff also made five All-Star teams. He won a ring with the Braves. He has a 303 postseason batting average with 10 bombs and 188 at-bats, and he had six top 10 MVP seasons. His career batting line after 19 seasons is 284, 377 on base, 509 slugging, and he won three silver sluggers with an all-star game MVP for good measure. Add all that to the fact that Fred McGriff is one of the nicest guys in the league, popular with the fans, media seem to like him, so they don't want to put in Bonds, Clemens, or McGuire because of steroids or because they're jerks. 
yet they keep out this wonderful guy who did not do steroids and hit 493 home runs. How do you keep out Fred McGriff? What's going on? Let's move on to the Texas Rangers. I'm going to go with Al Oliver, who spent four seasons in Arlington and also a whole bunch with the Pirates. He made a total of seven All-Star teams, two with the Rangers, and he also won a batting title with the Expos hitting 331 in 1982 with a league high 204 hits and 109 RBI. He received MVP votes in 10 separate seasons and retired with a batting average of 303 in over 9,000 career at-bats. Imagine hitting over 300 in 9,000 Major League at-bats and you can't sniff the Hall of Fame. He has more career hits than Chipper Jones, Lou Gehrig, and Ted Williams. How was his Hall of Fame support in the first year on the ballot, you ask? Less than 5% of the vote and he fell off immediately. And to this day, he's still getting denied by the Hall of Fame who won't even put him on the veterans ballot. Al Oliver got completely snubbed. He deserves more consideration and that's who I'm taking for the Rangers. Just two more teams and we'll start with the Blue Jays. And I could have given any number of guys to the Jays like Fred McGriff, Omar Vizquel, Roger Clemens. I even considered Dave Steeb who made seven All-Star teams, but ultimately, I had to find a place for one guy, and it's Jeff Kent. He was drafted by the Blue Jays. He made his debut with them, but he found most of his success with the Mets, Giants, Astros, Dodgers, and he also played for the Indians. But Jeff Kent, I'm going to give to the Blue Jays. This is a four-time Silver Slugger, five-time All-Star, who won the 2000 MVP despite playing on the same team as Barry Bonds. But the stat that makes it most shocking that he hasn't gotten more Hall of Fame support is the fact that Jeff Kent has more home runs than any other second baseman ever. Mm. Don't smell right to me. He has the most. He's number one at his position in home runs. And he's also been a clutch postseason player with multiple big moments. He finished his career with nine postseason home runs in just 170 at bats. This dude is an absolute Hall of Famer. He has his MVP. He has his all-star selections. He's done everything you need to and more. And he gets snubbed every year. They gave him 27.5% of the vote in 2020. An absolute joke. Jeff Kent is my snub for the Jays. You could also pick any number of these guys. The ultimate guy would be McGriff. But, you know, Vizquel, Clemens, all these guys are Jays snubs. But just for the purpose of getting one for every team, I'm giving him Jeff Kent. And my final snub, appropriately enough, is the Hit King. And he's going to represent the Montreal Expos, now called the Washington Nationals, even though he didn't spend much time with them. But I had to find someone to represent Montreal. And since they finally voted in Tim Raines, I'm going to go with Pete Rose. And besides, I want to end this video with Pete Rose. Even though, yes, he gambled on the game, he deserved to be on the ineligible list. He deserved to be banned from participating as a player, coach, or manager. But at the time, there was no rule that said that he could not get in the Hall of Fame until the Hall of Fame themselves decided to create that rule that once Rose was on the ineligible list, they said, oh, we're going to make a new rule that anyone on the ineligible list is also ineligible for the Hall of Fame. And I believe it's a terrible policy because the purpose of the rule was to keep gamblers from participating in MLB games. It could be a threat to the integrity of the game. But Having a plaque in a museum is no threat to the integrity of the game. It's a plaque. It does not affect actual games. And Pete Rose has more hits than anyone who has ever played this game. And not only that, he was this, just the perfect example of how to play hard, how to give it 100, 120% every single day. He ran out every grounder. He sprinted every time. He was not athletically gifted, but he worked hard and became a major league player, not just a major league player, one of the greatest and had more hits than anyone. Yes, he wasn't perfect in his personal life, especially after retirement, but you know what? This dude should be immortalized in Cooperstown. He is Pete Rose, and it should be done while he's still alive to enjoy it. Pete Rose, even if he's not allowed to wear the uniform again as an active participant, which is understandable, and I agree with that, because he did bet on the game, but he still deserves a plaque in Cooperstown. Pete Rose is my final snub. I'm going to give it to the Montreal Expos, now known as the Washington Nationals, but really Pete Rose is the Reds snub as well. Phillies. He is the ultimate snub, the ultimate snub. Pete Rose needs a plaque. It is truly embarrassing that baseball 
has a Hall of Fame dedicated to all the greatest who ever played, yet the hit king and the home run king and perhaps the greatest pitcher of all time are all on the outside looking in. And even if you want to say, hey, man, they they did wrong, whether it's steroids, whether it's betting, whatever. Okay, fine. What's the excuse for all the other guys I talked about? What about Fred McGriff? What about Andrew Jones? What about Al Oliver? The Hall of Fame, yes, it's tough to get into, but history has shown. You don't have to be Babe Ruth or Randy Johnson to get in. And if guys like Ozzy Smith and Luke Appling and now Harold Baines are Hall of Famers, so are these guys. The vast majority of guys I talked about today deserve a plaque. And until they get in, or at least get a fair shake, I'm going to call them snubs and the biggest Hall of Fame snubs in baseball. That's my list for each team getting one representative as a snub that deserves to get in the Hall of Fame. Let me know who else I missed because I'm sure there's others, but this is my list just going to each team. Let me know what you guys think down below. I really appreciate you watching this video. Hope you enjoyed it. Have a great day. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that thumbs up button as well for constant baseball videos, historical baseball videos, current baseball videos, talking about news, post game shows. We do it all here on the Hum Baby Baseball channel. We're going to talk to you guys very, very soon. See ya!